close your eyes and picture Gil-galad, the last high king of the Noldor, the spear-wielding supreme commander of the Last Alliance, a guy whose name means Starlight, a guy who gave his life to cripple Sauron forever, Gil-galad, perhaps the most epic dude in the entire Second Age. Now, without overthinking or worrying that there might be a wrong answer, in your mind, what colour is Gil-galad's hair? Maya, Govan and Melanine, and welcome to another Tolkien Untangled lore video. Today I'll be talking about High King Gil-galad, a 10 out of 10 indisputable badass, an absolute highlight of the Second Age. But it's not his military deeds or his contributions to the plot that I want to focus on right now. Instead, this is a video about a mystery. It's about a question. Who is Gil-galad's father? And at the heart of that question is another question. What should we consider canon when it comes to Tolkien's writings? Now, on the one hand, I'm aware the ambiguity of Gil-galad's dad is not the biggest deal in the world, and also the colour of his hair isn't even the most salient part of that ambiguity, but this question is going to take us down a rabbit hole, and at the end of that rabbit hole is some really fascinating stuff. By exploring the origins of Gil-galad's character, what we're really exploring is how the entire legendarium works, how it evolved over Tolkien's lifetime, and how we as fans can all individually interpret it. So, Gil-galad. Why does it matter who his father was? Well, the reason people care is because Tolkien gave us two completely contradictory answers. They can't both be true, so which one should we believe? Which one is canon? Well, I'll get to that in the second half of this video, but first I want to hear your thoughts. What colour is Gil-galad's hair? Surely everyone is going to have their own ideas, but I reckon most of you guys are going to fall into one of three camps, because at its core, this video is a tale of three Gil-galads. There is Gil-galad the Dark, Gil-galad the Gold, and Gil-galad the Silver. Now, obviously, Gil-galad's actions have nothing to do with his hair colour or his parentage. This question doesn't really affect the events of his life or his role in the story, but I truly do believe that the ambiguity of Gil-galad's descent, the question of which line of Noldorine princes he comes from, fundamentally affects the context of his character. It changes his place in the big picture, and it influences the way I conceive of him in my mind. So, I will get to the question of what is canon in just a little bit, but before I do, here's an illustration of what I'm talking about. Here is a tale of three different Gil-galads. Actually, just before I go on, I anticipate there may be one or two people getting ready to tell me that I'm mispronouncing Gilgalad. It's not an easy name to get right, but I think Gilgalad is how Tolkien would have said it. My main piece of evidence for this is that there is a poem called The Fall of Gilgalad, which Sam recites in The Lord of the Rings, and that poem begins, Gilgalad was an elven king, of him the harpers sadly sing. There's a rhythm to this poem. It forces you to say the name in a certain way. Gilgalad doesn't fit. Only Gilgalad matches the beat with of him the. Anyway, let's start with Team Dark Hair. Let's talk about Gilgalad's place in the big picture if we accept what's written in the Silmarillion. So, in that story, we are told unambiguously that Gil-galad is the son of High King Finnegon, grandson of High King Fingolfin, and thus we can confidently speculate that he would almost certainly have had dark hair just like them. 
But before I get into this, I should point out that I am not coming at this from a totally unbiased perspective. I do have a personal preference for this version of Gilgalad the Dark Haired. This is what I personally believe to be canon for myself. But the whole point of this video is that all three versions are awesome, and in the case of Gilgalad, you can't have an opinion on who his father was without contradicting something that Tolkien wrote somewhere. Anyway, Fingon, son of Fingolfin. According to the Silmarillion, Gil-galad is the third part of this High King triad, this trinity of awesome. Gil-galad is sort of like a second age echo of that first age epicness. So, the reason that I find this version of Gil-galad so great is because of the thematic symmetry between these three guys. Father, son, and grandson. Three high kings who all fit together in a kind of trilogy. There's the thesis, the antithesis, and the synthesis. Fingolfin, Finigon, Gilgalad. Back at the very beginning, the first ever king of the Noldor was a guy called Finwë. And Finwë had three sons, three princes from whom all Noldorine royalty are descended. If you saw last week's video explaining the elven royal families, then you'll know what I'm talking about. The first son of Finwë was Feanor, a genius craftsman, but also a terrible person. And there's not a single version of events that places Gil-galad in his line of descent. The second son of Finwë was Fingolfin, and Fingolfin is known primarily for being a valiant warrior. Whereas Feanor was a genius, but also a dick, Fingolfin is a fighter, but also a thoroughly good person. He embodies Faramir's sentiment from the Lord of the Rings of, I do not love the bright sword for its sharpness, nor the arrow for its swiftness, nor the warrior for his glory, I love only that which they defend. Anyway, the third son of Finwë's was the patriarch of the golden-haired house of Finarfin, and I will get to them in just a few minutes. But staying with Fingolfin for now, the thing that this guy is most famous for doing is that in the Silmarillion, towards the end of the First Age, he fights an unbelievably heroic one-on-one -on -one duel against the Dark Lord Morgoth. It is perhaps the Silmarillion's most epic moment. I already have two videos where I talk all about why this is so, so, so cool. I won't go into details right now, but what matters is that in this breathtakingly awesome showdown, Fingolfin was brutally slain. But before he was, he gave his life to inflict crippling, permanent wounds upon the Dark Lord. Fingolfin died, but he messed up Mordegoth forever. He permanently crippled a god. He gave his life to prove to all people, both good and evil, that no one, not even the Dark Lord himself, is so terrible as to be untouchable. That is the legacy of Fingolfin. But then, 17 years later, Fingolfin's son, the new High King, Fingon, had a very similar, yet simultaneously very different, one-on-one -on -one showdown with another Lord of Evil. In the Fifth Battle of Beleriand, High King Fingon went toe-to-toe -to -toe with Morgoth's physically strongest lieutenant, Gothmog, the Lord of all Balrogs. Just like his father, Fingon stood alone, and just like his father, Fingon died. But whereas Fingolfin's death was both sad and uplifting in equal measure, Fingon's death is just brutal. Unlike Fingolfin, Fingon did not get a fair fight. As he battled Gothmog one on one, another Balrog came up behind him, tied his hands behind his back, and then Gothmog plunged his black axe into Fingon's head, killing him instantly. Fingon doesn't die in a blaze of glory, he is murdered by a cheating enemy. There is no honour for Fingon. Whereas Fingolfin's body was carried off by the King of the Eagles and laid to rest in a high place of peace, Fingon's body was beaten into the dust 
by an enemy without honour. His banner was trampled in the mire of his own blood. It's so brutal. It's so adjacent to Finnegolfin's death, and yet in some ways it is the antithesis. It's really not a badass moment, it's just really sad. But this brings us, finally, to Gil-galad. According to the Team Dark Hair Silmarillion version of things, this is the world that Gil-galad inherited. After this fifth battle, the kingdom that his grandfather built and his father ruled is now conquered by the enemy. His people are either dead or imprisoned or scattered. The First Age is hurtling towards its lowest low, and in the span of only 17 years, young Gil-galad has lost two timeless, ageless, immortal forefathers. By the tail end of the First Age, young Gil-galad is a refugee living on an island of exiles, powerless to prevent the seemingly ineluctable tide of darkness that is swiftly sweeping over all lands. In fact, according to the Silmarillion, Gil-galad isn't even the High King at this point. Instead, it is Fingon's brother, King Turagon of Gondolin, who takes up the High Kingship. And this is often cited as evidence that Gil-galad shouldn't really be the son of Fingon. It is a bit bizarre that a brother would inherit over a son, but I don't think this is a deal-breaker. At the time that all of this is happening, there is only one bastion of Noldoreen resistance left in all of Middle-earth, and that is Turdegon's hidden city of Gondolin. He is the king of Gondolin, and shortly after the death of Finnegon, every Noldoreen place that isn't Gondolin is wiped out. So it makes sense that Turgon would become High King. No other Noldo has anything that could even constitute a kingdom at this point. Also, Gil-galad is still pretty young, and his father Fingon sent him away from his realm before the outbreak of the Fourth Battle to go and live with Círdan the Shipwright in his havens by the coast, where he would hopefully, although not actually, be free to be raised in peace far away from the encroaching war. Anyway, only 38 years after Finnegon died, his brother Turagon also died. Gil-galad became the last High King of the Noldor. And then, very soon after that, the First Age ended. Gil-galad had very little to do with the final war of the First Age, but when the Second Age rolled around, suddenly he becomes the central figure. In the first years of the Second Age, he builds a new kingdom all of his own in the very last part of Beleriand to survive the downfall of the First Age. Gil-galad becomes a warrior king who fights to bring peace to his people. He grows into a Second Age echo of his First Age forefathers, the heir of Fingolfin, the son of Fingon. And then, three and a half thousand years after that, at the end of the Second Age, Gil-galad does the thing that he's most famous for doing. He follows in his ancestors' footsteps. He embodies the final part of that badass trinity. Just like Fingolfin and Fingon, Gil-galad fights an epic duel against a new Dark Lord at the end of a new age. Actually, technically it's not a duel, Elendil fights beside him, so there's three of them, but still, it represents the synthesis of what came before. Just like his grandfather did, Gil-galad permanently cripples the Dark Lord. He inflicts immobilizing injuries upon Sauron, he takes him down, and he gives his life to do it. In the final moments of the War of the Last Alliance, Gil-galad and Elendil stand together. They die together, and in so doing, Sauron is vanquished. The Second Age ends. In the First Age, Fingolfin proved that even gods can be made to bleed, and in the Second Age, his grandson takes things even further. Gil-galad doesn't just fight the Dark Lord, he sets the stage for his ruin. <laughs>
Well, at least until a hobbit finds a ring in a river. Also, if Gil-galad is the son of Finigon and the grandson of Finigolfin, I find that this enriches his relationship with two other major players of the Second Age, Círdan the Shipwright and Elrond. Also, maybe even Celebrimbor. As I said, according to this Gilgalad the Dark version of things, in his relative youth, Gilgalad was sent away by his father to be raised by Fingon's close personal friend, Círdan the Shipwright. And we know that during the Second Age, Círdan the Shipwright remained a super significant part of Gilgalad's life. He was a chief counsellor, they fought together in the War of the Last Alliance, they were fellow ring bearers. Círdan's lands of Mithlond, the Grey Havens, were within Gilgalad's kingdom of Lindon. There seems to be a really profound bond between these two, and I think this relationship is strengthened if Gilgalad were raised by Círdan upon the request of his father Finagon. Throughout the Silmarillion, we see a really interesting friendship between Finagon and Círdan, which is on the one hand quite unlikely, they are from completely different worlds, but multiple times we see that Finagon and Círdan do come to each other's aid when the going gets tough. Finagon's cavalry and Círdan's mariners join forces on the battlefield more than once. And because of that friendship, Círdan is the one who raises Gil-galad from a young prince of the First Age into High King of the Second Age. Círdan is not only Gil-galad's advisor and second in command, he's also his mentor slash almost adoptive father figure. For reasons that I'll explain in a minute, this does get a little bit lost if Gil-galad's father isn't Fingon. And in the opposite direction, Gil-galad the Dark-Haired also adds an extra dimension to his relationship with his younger protege, his vice-regent in the north, Elrond. Apart from Gil-galad, by the dawn of the Second Age, Elrond is the only other member of the line of Fingolfin left in Middle-earth. Elrond is the grandson of Gil-galad's first cousin. When Gil-galad dies, Elrond has every opportunity to become the new High King of the Noldor. He is next in line, but he chooses to let Gil-galad be the last. The reason that Elrond is simply the Lord of Rivendell as opposed to the High King of the Third Age is because he humbly chose to forego the kingship that he could have rightly claimed unless Gil-galad is the son of someone else. If that's the case, in a roundabout way, it kind of diminishes Elrond's humility a little bit. And it also diminishes the fact that when Gil-galad dies in the War of the Last Alliance, the two elves who stand beside him are his beloved mentor Círdan and his beloved protege Elrond. Also, finally, if Gil-galad is the grandson of Fingolfin, then this gives him an interesting kind of parallel with his second cousin and fellow awesome character, Celebrimbor, grandson of Fingolfin's elder brother, Feanor. Just as there's a generational trinity of epic warriors in Fingolfin, Finigon, and Gil-galad, there's also a generational trinity of morally complex craftsmen in Feanor, his son Kurufin the Crafty, and his grandson Celebrimbor. As I've said, Gilgalad is a Second Age echo of his First Age grandfather Fingolfin. They both died crippling Dark Lords, and Celebrimbor is a Second Age echo of his First Age grandfather Feanor. They both crafted three very powerful pieces of jewellery. Feanor hated Fingolfin and their relationship was entirely negative, but Gil-galad and Celebrimbor have a much more layered relationship. On the one hand, they are allies, but they're not on the same page. They are neighbours, but they are totally independent. They have a hugely significant disagreement, 
Yet, in the end, they do come back together. If Gil-galad is actually the great-grandson of someone else, then I think this Celebrimbor-Gil-galad parallel is also just a little bit diminished. So, Gil-galad the Dark, son of Finnegan, why do I prefer this version of the character? Well, apart from the reasons that I've already just given, I like how this version of Gil-galad's heritage gels with everything else that's written in the Silmarillion. Unlike Gil-galad the Golden-haired, for example, we don't have to dismantle and rewrite parts of the Silmarillion to make this version of Gil-galad fit with everything else. Gil-galad the Dark enriches other parts of the story, whereas different versions contradict other parts of the story. However, there is one massively compelling argument against Gil-galad the Dark-haired, and that's that although I prefer Gil-galad being the son of Finnegan, we can say with absolute certainty that is not what Tolkien intended by the end of his life. In writings that can be dated to sometime in 1959, Tolkien gave us a totally different account of who Gil-galad's father was, and this version is what I'm referring to when I say Gil-galad the Golden. So, in an essay called The Shibboleth of Feanor, Tolkien tells us that Gil-galad was actually fathered by a golden-haired prince of the Noldor called Orodreth of the Golden House of Finarfin, as opposed to Finagolfin. And in a commentary on that Shibboleth of Feanor essay, Christopher Tolkien wrote, There can be no doubt that this was my father's last word on the subject. So on the one hand, there's your answer. Tolkien intended for Gil-galad to belong to the Golden House of Finarfin. Surely that is what's canon, right? Well, okay, I'll go down that rabbit hole in a few minutes, but first I want to explain how the context of this Team Golden Gil-galad differs from the version I've just talked about, and I will go into my favourite and least favourite parts of this version. Starting with the positives. If Gil-galad is the son of Orodreth, then that implies a much, much closer relationship between Gil-galad and the other member of the House of Finarfin to survive into the Second Age. We might lose a little bit of the Gil-galad Elrond familial bond and the Gil-galad Círdan thing, but we gain a much, much richer Gil-galad Galadriel bond. If Gil-galad is the son of Orodreth, grandson of Arngrod and great-grandson of Finarfin, as is told in these later writings, then that means that he is Galadriel's grand-nephew. And I do think it's very, very cool that there is a version of events where Galadriel stands in real close proximity to the High Kingship during the Second Age. She is the great aunt of the High King. Although, this does raise an interesting point that wouldn't necessarily be the case in the other version. If the High Kingship of the Noldor went from Finnegan to Turgon, because in this version Finnegan had no children, and then it went from Turgon to the grandson of his younger cousin, that seems to state explicitly that women among the Noldor cannot inherit the throne. Galadriel has a way stronger claim to succeed her cousin Turgon than the son of her younger nephew, Orodreth, and it does strike me as a little bit odd that Galadriel, who we know desires to rule a realm of her own, would pass up the chance to rule all the Noldor. It seems weirdly out of character. I mean, I don't know, there's very little that can be said about Second Age Galadriel with absolute certainty, and perhaps we could speculate that, yeah, for whatever reason, maybe Galadriel was offered the chance to be the High Queen of the Noldor, but for some reason she willingly turned it down and yielded her claim to her grandnephew Gil-galad. Or maybe it is just a fact that among the Noldor, only male heirs can inherit. Although if there were ever a woman to challenge that succession, surely it would be Galadriel. Either way though, it doesn't really seem to gel with the rest of what's written about Galadriel's character, and it does just kind of muddy the water in a way that Gil-galad, son of Finnegan, simply doesn't. However, another thing that I do really enjoy about Gil-galad the Golden is that in this version, it massively elevates the importance 
of the House of Finarfin. The early parts of the Quenta Silmarillion place a really significant focus on the conflict between the houses of Feanor and Fingolfin. Both Feanor and Fingolfin journeyed to Middle-earth, they both fought the Dark Lord in the First Age, and they're both really, really important parts of the plot. But Finarfin kind of isn't. Before the story transitions over to Middle-earth and becomes about the War of the Jewels, Finarfin bows out of it. His children go with Fingolfin, but Finarfin himself stays in the Undying Lands. He becomes the High King of the Noldor who remain in paradise in the uttermost west, and he almost never features again in the story. However, if in the Second Age Finarfin's great-grandson Gil-galad becomes the High King of all Noldor in Middle-earth, then that would mean the House of Finarfin are kind of at the head of this intercontinental elvish superpower. I don't want to say Noldoreen Empire, I feel like that's got slightly negative connotations, but if this is the case, then all Noldor on both sides of the Sundering Seas would be ruled by a High King of the same house. The House of Finarfin would rule all Noldor everywhere. That could not be the case if Gil-galad were the son of Fingon. Also, in the Silmarillion, we are never told who Gil-galad the Dark's mother was, so we can only speculate. But in Tolkien's later writings, we are told that Gil-galad the Golden was the son of Orodreth and a Sindarin Lady of the North. And I find that this is a cool little detail. I've often liked to imagine that Fingon took a wife from among the Sindar and that Gil-galad was a child of both worlds, but that was always just my own personal speculation. However, in the case of Orodreth, this is explicitly stated. Tolkien tells us that Gil-galad the Gold has a Noldorine father and a Sindarin mother. He represents a coming together of High Elves and Dark Elves, Valinor and Middle-earth just like his cousin once removed, Celebrian, daughter of Galadriel and Celeborn. And one more thing that I will admit is really, really lovely about our golden-haired Gilgalad is that in this version, he kind of redeems the line of Orodreth. Part of the reason, I think, that I prefer Gilgalad the Dark is because both Finagon and Fingolfin are so utterly badass, and Gil-galad is just like them. But with uh, all due respect to this fictional character of Orodreth, he is not the most epic member of his family, not by a long way. I said before on this channel that Orodreth strikes me kind of like a bit of a discount version of his uncle Finrod Felagund, best elf ever. That's my subjective opinion, but objectively, Finrod is amazing. And Orodreth is similar, but he's just not as good. He plays an important role in the Children of Húrin, but in that story we see Orodreth just doesn't have the wisdom that his uncle Finrod Felagund had, and he doesn't have the strength of will that his aunt Galadriel has. There's an important theme in Tolkien's writings concerning the fading of greatness over time, the diminishing of the Eldar days. Middle-earth is a world in decline, and Orodreth could perhaps be an example of that. Back in the beginning of the Noldor's history, we have Finwë, a prime evil elf from the deeps of time, chosen by the Valar to be a liaison between them and his people. Then you have Feanor and Fingolfin, these almost mythological figures. Then you have their sons, who are legendary characters, but not quite as awe-inspiring as their fathers. And by the time we get to Orodreth, towards the end of the First Age, a good deal of what came before has now faded. Orodreth is good, but he's not great. He makes bad decisions, he's too easily swayed, and he never gets that moment of epicness that most other members of his family get. However, Gil-galad totally does. Orodreth may be the weakest link in Finarfin's dynasty, but Gil-galad is every bit as awesome as those who came before. 
just like Fingolfin, Gil-galad takes down a Dark Lord. Just like Finwë, Gil-galad rules for thousands of years. He, along with his great aunt Galadriel, are among the last vestiges of the Eldar days, still going strong in the middle days of the Second Age. And that is cool. Whereas Gil-galad the Dark's character has to grapple with whether he can be worthy of the epicness of the House of Fingolfin, Gil-galad the Golden's character has to grapple with whether he can redeem the relative decline of the House of Finarfin. Regardless of which version you consider canon, the answer is, in both cases, yes, he can. But the problem with Gil-galad the Golden is that although we know for a fact that this is what Tolkien intended by the end of his life, it's not what he wrote. And if we choose to believe that Gil-galad is the son of Ordredreth, then there are so many parts of the Silmarillion and other writings that become either questionable or in some cases straight up incompatible. For example, in all of Tolkien's writings, Ordredreth definitely does have a daughter called Finduilas. And if we believe that Gil-galad is also the child of Ordredreth, that would make him Finduilas's brother. In fact, Tolkien explicitly states that this is the case in those later writings. However, both Ordredreth and Finduilas are relatively important characters in the tale of the children of Húrin. And I don't want to get into spoilers here, I will be releasing a full Children of Houdin Explained series in the near future, we'll go into all those specifics, but what I'll say right now is that there comes a moment in that tale where Finduilas' life is in danger, and the whole point of what's going on in the story is that only the child of Houdin can save her. But if Finduilas' brother is the super badass Giligalad, why would that be the case? Why can't he save her? Perhaps one could argue that maybe Ordredreth had sent Gilgalad away to go live with Círdan, just like Finnegan did in the actual Silmarillion, but this raises a load of questions too. Firstly, Ordredreth and Círdan do not have that same relationship that Finnegan had with Círdan. As far as we know, Ordredreth only has one interaction with Círdan in the entire story, and it's indirectly, via messengers. And in that interaction, Ordredreth sends the messengers away. He ignores Círdan's counsel, he even belittles it. So I'm just not really sure it would make sense for Ordredreth to entrust Círdan with his son and heir. Also, even if they were close friends, Finnegan sent Gil-galad to Círdan because his realm faced imminent war, and Círdan's realm was safer. But the whole point of Ordredreth's realm is that it's super safe and super secret, at least at first. So sending Gil-galad away from it would be putting him closer to danger. And finally, why would Ordredreth send his son Gil-galad away to safety, but not his daughter Finduilas? It's a very, very interesting thing to muse on and to think about, but Gil-galad the Golden simply does not fit into the Silmarillion in the way that Gil-galad the Dark does. Gil-galad son of Ordredreth may be what Tolkien intended, but he just didn't have the time to make it work with the rest of what he wrote. However, before I move on to the question of canon, there is one more wrinkle in this whole dark hair versus golden hair debate, and it's pretty wild. So, back in 1954, The Lord of the Rings was published for the first time, and so, for the first time, readers were introduced to a character called High King Gil-galad. But in The Lord of the Rings, there is absolutely no indication of who Gil-galad's father was or where he came from, he's just one more example of a textual ruin. He's a reference to a part of Middle-earth's history, but only a glimpse. He's an intriguing mystery. But then, 22 years later, the Silmarillion was published, and finally readers were told who this Gil-galad guy actually is. He's the son of Fingon, grandson of Fingolfin, and thanks to the Silmarillion, their stories are now fleshed out in great detail. 
Gilgalad went from a textual ruin on the periphery of a wider story to an actual character with a lineage that makes sense. Until in 1996, The Peoples of Middle-earth was published. Almost overnight, 20 years of Gilgalad, son of Finnegan, suddenly turned into Gilgalad, son of Ordredreth. And so, I imagine, that this would have been the first time that the question of Gilgalad's hair colour would have started to matter. Is it dark, like Finnegan's, or is it golden, like Ordredreth's? Over the next 25 years, different artists portrayed Gilgalad differently. Some with golden hair, some with dark hair. Peter Jackson's movies opted for dark hair, and that probably affected public perception for a bit, but there are plenty of instances of both. But then, in the year 2021, so last year, everything changed again. You see, in the newly published Nature of Middle-earth, we are given a brief note that was written in 1969 and included in one of Tolkien's linguistic papers. And in that note, we are finally explicitly told exactly what colour Gilgalad's hair is. But the answer is mad. According to Tolkien, Gilgalad did not have dark hair but he also did not have golden hair. Instead, we are told that Gilgalad was given his name because of the radiance of his silver hair. Silver hair? That blew my mind when I first read it. That probably was the craziest piece of information that I gleaned from the nature of Middle-earth. Silver hair is almost always associated with the Sindar not the Noldor. We do know of one full-blooded Noldo who did have grey hair, but regardless of who Gilgalad's father was, she is definitely not his relative. However, that said, I do think that silver-haired Gilgalad is very interesting, and not just for aesthetic reasons. A massive part of the Golden House of Finarfin is the golden hair that they all inherited from Finarfin's mother, Indis of the Golden-Haired Vanyar. They are instantly recognisable among the rest of their family for this reason. And yet, curiously, Gilgalad does not share that trait. Now, I'm aware I may be placing a little bit too much emphasis on hair colour here. It's not something I think we should take too seriously. It's just a fun little insight into a much more profound part of the lore. But since reading about Gilgalad the Silver in Nature of Middle-earth, it has opened up a third perspective for me on this character. You see, what Gilgalad literally means is Star of Radiance. But in many cases, the name is translated simply as Starlight. Gilgalad means Starlight, but this isn't actually his given name. It's an honorary name given later in life, sort of like a nickname. Gilgalad's father name, the name he had from birth, is Erenion, which means Scion of Kings. But he is remembered to history simply as High King Starlight. Actually, because nothing is ever straightforward with this guy, in some versions, Gilgalad is a mother name instead of an honorary name, so perhaps you've been asking the wrong question this whole time. Perhaps I should have been asking, who is Gilgalad's mother? Anyway, for what I'm talking about right now, it doesn't matter who gave him the name Gilgalad. What matters is Gilgalad's association with silver. His association with starlight. And the fascinating fact that Starlight becomes such a hugely significant part of his identity. It is literally what he becomes named for. And if Gilgalad is born with silver hair, which is incredibly rare among the Noldor, it could imply that from birth he was marked out as different. Perhaps he came into the world not to be the heir of Finngolfin or the heir of Finarfin. Instead, he is simply his own thing. The silver-haired king of starlight. And before we can move on from the questions of who Gilgalad's father was, there is one more quotation that I need to pull out. 
because we know that Gilgalad the Dark is the only version that fits with the rest of the Legendarium, and we know that Gilgalad the Golden was Tolkien's last word on the subject. But we also know that Christopher Tolkien, the guy who edited both the Silmarillion and the later writings, wrote this in reference to the whole Gilgalad father debate. It would have been very much better to have left Gilgalad's parentage obscure. According to Christopher Tolkien, with the benefit of hindsight, it was a mistake to come down on one side or the other. Gilgalad's origins always should have remained a textual ruin. Now, personally, I am very glad that this isn't the case. I think it would be a bit unsatisfying if the official answer to who is Gilgalad's father turned out to be you're not supposed to know. But that said, there is something very cool about a textual ruin, an entirely mysterious part of ancient history, a silver-haired high king of the Second Age whose original name meant Scion of Kings, but not any specific king. Instead, he is remembered exclusively in the annals of Middle-earth as High King Starlight. A guy who emerged from the dark unknown, a silver light shining out of the shadows of the Eldar days. An ultra mysterious Gilgalad the Silver might not be quite as satisfying as the son of Fingon or the son of Orodreth, but it is undeniably very mythological and very, very cool. Perhaps no one can say for certain where he came from, but Gilgalad the Silver is a guy who all elves of the Second Age look to. He is a shining point of light in an age of darkness. It would seem that before the Second Age began, there was no Gilgalad the Silver, but at the moment it did begin, he was there. High King Starlight. And at the moment he dies, the Second Age ends. On the one hand, it might be a bit of a shame to divorce Gilgalad entirely from the epicness of the First Age, but if we do, then he becomes so much more intimately bound to the Second Age. And I think that's also a really cool perspective on this character. But, with all that said, the question now is which one should be considered canon? Should we go with the only version that's consistent with the rest of the Legendarium? Should we go with the version that we know beyond a doubt Tolkien intended at the end of his life? Or should we go with the version that, according to Christopher Tolkien, would have been very much better with hindsight? Dark, gold, or silver? Finnegan, Orodreth, or unknown? Well, the short answer is that you are of course free to believe whatever you want, and if we all disagree, that's totally fine. Such is the nature of literature. However, if you want a more technical answer, we need to take a look at the entirety of Tolkien's Legendarium. We need to examine its evolution over 59 years and explore whether we can ever actually apply a concept as rigid as canon to a body of work as organic as Tolkien's. And I guess among Tolkien fans and scholars, there seems to be two different schools of thought here. First is perhaps the most straightforward and intuitive, and that is the final intent principle. Basically, when it comes to contradictions within the Legendarium, the later writings should always take precedent. A great example of this would be the Blue Wizards. In 1958, Tolkien told us that the Blue Wizards went into the East, and there I fear that they failed, as Saruman did, though doubtless in different ways, and I suspect that they were founders or beginners of secret cults and magic traditions that outlasted the fall of Sauron. In other words, the Blue Wizards fell to the dark side. However, in the last year of his life, Tolkien wrote something totally different. In his last writings, we are told that the Blue Wizards must have had very great influence on the history of the Second Age and Third Age, in weakening and disarraying the forces of the East, who would both in the Second Age and Third Age otherwise have outnumbered the West. 
So, in this case it makes a lot of sense to follow the final intent principle, and accept that Tolkien's final word on the Blue Wizards was that they didn't fail, and instead they had a very great influence on the histories of the Second and Third Ages. And by this final intent principle, Gil-galad is, beyond a doubt, the son of Ordredreth, not Fimigon. But final intent is not without its problems. For example, we know, beyond any doubt, that towards the end of Tolkien's life, he changed his mind on the cosmology of Arda. In the Silmarillion, we are told that Arda was a flat world, until towards the end of the Second Age, it was broken, Numenor was drowned, and the world was made round. In the Silmarillion, we are told that the sun and the moon came from the last fruit and flower of the gold and silver trees Laureline and Telperion. The moon rose for the first time at the very moment Fingolfin arrived in Middle-earth, and the sun rose for the first time at the very moment the race of men awoke. That is the mythology of the Lord of the Rings and the Silmarillion. That is what's consistent with most other writings, but it's definitely not the author's last word. Towards the end of his life, Tolkien began experimenting with a round Earth cosmology. He tried to make Arida less mythological and more scientifically plausible. In the later versions of this round Arida, the sun and the moon are not a fruit and flower of the two trees, the sun is older than everything, and the moon is just a dead lump of rock that broke away and now orbits Arida. And if we go with the final intent principle, then it's the round earth Arida that should be considered canon. The earlier, more mythological writings of like The Lord of the Rings and the Silmarillion should surely be invalidated. They were written before these unfinished drafts outlining a more astronomically true version of events. And yet, I reckon most people would raise an eyebrow to this. Surely, in the question of what's canon, everyone would agree that Lord of the Rings is canon, right? It was published in Tolkien's lifetime. It was written exclusively by him. It's a story, not a collection of notes. It's entirely finished, and most importantly, it was intended to be read by an audience. However, in some instances, it doesn't represent Tolkien's final intent. Which brings us to what I would call the pinnacle principle, the idea that Tolkien's writings reached some kind of peak in their development around the time that The Lord of the Rings was published, and some potentially contradictory unfinished notes and abandoned drafts that came afterwards should not take precedence over the established works, namely The Lord of the Rings, The Hobbit, and the Silmarillion. By this principle, Finnegan would be the father of Gil-galad. But the truth is, there are still problems here too. Because although most people would consider the Silmarillion canon, it wasn't actually published in Tolkien's lifetime, and technically, although 99% of it was written by him, it wasn't strictly finished when he died. Also, who is to say when a piece of writing is finished? The Hobbit is a good example to use here. In 1937, The Hobbit was published for the first time, and in that first edition, Gollum willingly bet his precious ring in the riddle game, and Bilbo wins it from him fair and square. That's how Bilbo came to possess his magic invisibility ring. However, then Tolkien wrote The Lord of the Rings, and Bilbo's magic ring suddenly becomes the one ring to rule them all. And considering what's written in Lord of the Rings, it doesn't make sense that Gollum would gamble the One Ring and give it up willingly after losing a riddle. That's not how the ring works. So Tolkien went back and he changed things. And I reckon almost everyone would agree that the revised version of The Hobbit is now what's canon, and the first edition has been superseded by these newer writings. But there are still a number of things in the newer canon, in air quotes, version of The Hobbit that don't seem to gel with the Lord of the Rings. For example, Bilbo has a clock on his wall, but there are no clocks in the Lord of the Rings. Similarly, Bilbo uses matches to light his pipe, but everyone in the Lord of the Rings uses flint. In many instances, the tone is wildly different, 
And Tolkien was aware of this. In the 1960s, he began a complete rewrite of The Hobbit to make it more consistent with The Lord of the Rings. He wrote a chapter or two, but then he abandoned it. He felt that by making The Hobbit more like The Lord of the Rings, it stopped being The Hobbit. It stopped being the charming children's story that he intended it to be. So, this rewrite never actually materialised. But does knowing this make the non-rewritten version of The Hobbit that we're all familiar with less canon? If we go with final intent, then yeah, maybe. But I think the point I'm making is that surely we can all kind of intuit that it's a bit crazy to dismiss something as iconic as The Hobbit from canon, even though we can't deny that it represents neither Tolkien's final intent, nor was it written at the pinnacle of the Legendarium's maturity. And so, before I finish this video, I want to provide a brief breakdown of the timeline of Tolkien's writings. Like, how did the Legendarium evolve over the span of Tolkien's life? And I want to do this because, honestly, I find this so fascinating. It totally recontextualizes how Tolkien's writings fit together. So, very briefly, let's start at the beginning. On the 24th of September, in the year 1914, so well over a hundred years ago, there was a 22-year-old, let me say this with the utmost respect, nerd, called John Ronald Raoul Tolkien. And on that day, he read to some of his friends a poem that he'd written, and that poem was called The Voyage of Eärendil the Evening Star. This poem is the very earliest fragment of what can be identified as a Middle-earth story. The voyages of Eärendil and how he became the Evening Star are a hugely significant part of the Legendarium, and they are also where the whole thing began. But this is not a novel. It was never intended to be published, it was just a piece of creative writing that Tolkien shared with his friends. We often think of Tolkien as being a fantasy novelist, and although that's definitely not an inaccurate description, it is, I think, imprecise. First and foremost, Tolkien was a professor of philology and Anglo-Saxon studies. He was an academic expert in language. He did also write a good few novels, but at the end of the day, Tolkien was a massive language nerd with an astounding imagination. During his youth, he had a passion for inventing languages, and what we now call his legendarium began simply as a vehicle to explore language. Even that poem, The Voyage of Eärendil the Evening Star, was fundamentally an exploration of Old English language. It was later renamed Eala Eärendil Engla Beotast because Tolkien knew that's what the Anglo-Saxons would have called it. Anyway, one month and twenty days before Tolkien introduced this poem to his friends, England entered World War I. As you surely know, Tolkien fought in it, and all but one of his closest friends died in it. While recovering from trench fever after the Battle of the Somme, Tolkien wrote the only complete version of the Fall of Gondoline. After watching his wife, Edith, dancing in a hemlock glade, the tale of Beren and Luthien formed in his mind. In 1917, he began writing the story that we now call The Children of Húrin. But none of these began as novels. They were intended only as a personal hobby, a private mythology in which to explore what Tolkien called his secret vice, inventing made-up languages. And while Tolkien was doing this for fun between the two world wars, his actual jobs included working for the Oxford English Dictionary, translating Beowulf into modern English, and in 1925, among other things, he became Professor of Anglo-Saxon at Oxford University. And yet, while he was doing all of that, he and his wife also had children. And as many fathers do, Tolkien began to invent stories to tell to his children. 
This is the period in which Tolkien went from an academic with an unusual hobby to an author of iconic fiction. And here is where things start to get really interesting. In 1925, Tolkien began a children's story called Roverandom. In 1926, he began Farmer Giles of Ham, and in 1928, he wrote a story called Mr. Bliss. And what's very cool is that although none of these stories have anything to do with Middle-earth, they are nothing to do with the Silmarillion, they do not belong to the Legendarium, in them we can see hints of what is to come. In Roverandom, we meet Tolkien's first wizard. We see the light of fairy and the mountains of elven home beyond the magic isles. In Mr. Bliss, there's a character called Sam Boffin and an old gaffer Gamgee. The basic plot of Farmer Giles is that a simple guy who wants only to live in peace and quiet ends up fighting a dragon. And then, in 1930, while marking exam papers, Tolkien scribbled down the words in a hole in the ground there lived a hobbit. Now, there are no hobbits in the Silmarillion, there's no reason to believe that this story, The Hobbit, would be any different from Farmer Giles or Roverandom, except that in the case of The Hobbit, Tolkien's private mythology and his stories for children began to bleed together. On the one hand, The Hobbit has nothing to do with the Silmarillion, but the blade of Bilbo Baggins does come from a place called Gondolin. When we meet the elves of Mirkwood, Tolkien also mentions some other types of elves, the Light Elves, the Deep Elves, and the Sea Elves in the West. No one could have known it at the time, but these three clans of elves are the Vanyar, Noldor, and Teleri. The Arkenstone in The Hobbit is adjacent to a Silmaril. The elven king of Mirkwood is adjacent to the elven king who fathers Luthien Tinuviel. The half-elven lord that Bilbo meets in Rivendell turns out to be the son of Eärendil. Whilst writing The Hobbit, Tolkien's private mythology of the Eldar days collided with his commercially published fiction for the first time. This was the moment that his myths met his stories. And, as you definitely already know, people really, really liked The Hobbit. In the same year it was released, the publisher insisted that Tolkien write a sequel. Seventeen years later, the first part of that sequel was revealed to the world, and it was called The Lord of the Rings. But what is so, so cool about this is that although The Lord of the Rings began as a sequel to The Hobbit, that is not how it ended up. During those 17 years in which Tolkien crafted the Lord of the Rings, things changed. And we can pinpoint exactly where that change occurred. So, The Hobbit is a story about Bilbo Baggins leaving Bag End to go on a quest and acquire some jewellery. Lord of the Rings is a story about the heir of Bilbo Baggins leaving Bag End to go on a quest to get rid of some jewellery. And the first nine chapters of the first book of The Lord of the Rings really do feel like a Hobbit sequel. They have that fairy tale feel to them. In chapter one, there is a firework that is compared to a freight train. In chapter three, we meet a talking fox, sort of. In chapter seven, we meet Tom Bombadil. This all feels very much closer in tone to The Hobbit than it does to the Silmarillion. But then our Hobbit heroes come to the Prancing Pony. And in Tolkien's original draft, there they met another Hobbit with wooden feet called Trotter. And Trotter was the guide who led them to Rivendell. But over the course of those 17 years, Tolkien decided that this Trotter character didn't really work. So, Trotter the Hobbit with wooden feet evolved into Strider the Ranger, heir of Isildur. In that chapter, where Aragorn uses his true name for the first time, all of a sudden, Lord of the Rings pivots from a Hobbit sequel to a Silmarillion sequel. Immediately after Strider enters the story, the more whimsical elements like Tom Bombadil and the Talking Fox are replaced with Aragorn's song about Luthien Tinuviel. 
Bilbo's song about Eärendil the Mariner, Sam Gamgee's song about Gil-galad, the Elven King. Just a few years before The Lord of the Rings was finished, Tolkien wrote a fascinating little letter to his publisher. And in that letter, he said that his private mythology, the Silmarillion, has refused to be suppressed. It has bubbled up, infiltrated, and spoiled everything which I have tried to write since. It was kept out of Farmer Giles with an effort, but stopped the continuation. Its shadow was deep on the later parts of The Hobbit. It has captured the Lord of the Rings, so that that has become simply its continuation and completion, requiring the Silmarillion to be fully intelligible. Isn't that wild? The Silmarillion captured Tolkien's other writings. He didn't intend for the Hobbit to share canon with the Silmarillion, but he just couldn't keep those writings out. The myths that he invented as a hobby infiltrated the stories that he became known for. And because they did, the Lord of the Rings was born. But that still isn't quite it. Return of the King was first published in 1955, but by 1959, Tolkien retired from academia. He left the university and he dedicated his work life to his legendarium. I mean, there's more to it than that. Tolkien wrote a lot of things in his retirement, not all of them part of the legendarium, but what he did not create was any new epic of Middle-earth. He went back and he updated much of his early Silmarillion, he wrote some unfinished tales, and he wrote an absolute ton of notes and essays and drafts about like really technical aspects of the legendarium, super specific stuff like explorations of the body and soul, or how consonant sounds soften over time in his invented languages, or how the mathematics of elven reproduction works. It's fascinating, but it's not a story. And just like the earlier stuff, it really wasn't intended for anyone but himself. Then, on September the 2nd, 1973, Tolkien died. And on that day, the only parts of the legendarium that existed to the general public were The Hobbit, The Lord of the Rings, The Adventures of Tom Bombadil, and a book of Hobbit songs called The Road Goes Ever On and On. The Silmarillion was almost complete, but not yet publishable, and the unfinished tales, the history of Middle-earth and the nature of Middle-earth were, in 1973, mostly just handwritten notes scrawled on pieces of scrap paper that in many cases weren't even dated. And that would be the end of the story, if not for Tolkien's son. Between 1973 and 1976, Christopher Tolkien dedicated himself to sorting through his father's mythology of the Eldar days, the Silmarillion. He collected all those First Age writings and he compiled them into one relatively coherent story. But he didn't do what I imagine a lot of other people in his position might have been tempted to do. He didn't establish canon. In the Silmarillion's foreword, Christopher Tolkien wrote that a complete consistency, either within the compass of the Silmarillion itself or between the Silmarillion and other published writings of my father's, is not to be looked for, and could only be achieved, if at all, at heavy and needless cost. And I think about these words quite a lot. Christopher Tolkien was the only person in the entire world who could have added a whole new load of material to his father's writings that probably still would be considered canon by many people. But he had no interest in doing so. He made no effort to present a single canon narrative. Instead, he simply chose to make everything his father wrote available for us to read. Contradictions and all. And so, these notes, these private musings of Tolkien's that were never really intended to be read, are an absolute privilege to have. I am so profoundly grateful that we get to explore them, but I think it's really important to bear in mind where they came from when talking about a true version of events in Tolkien's Legendarium. Other franchises have canon because other franchises were created as stories for an audience to consume. But that's not what interested Tolkien. 
and it's not what interested his son. Middle-earth isn't that fantasy world where those stories take place. Middle-earth is the life's work of a genius. So, to give a short answer at the end of a very long video, how do we pick and choose what we consider canon? Well, I would say, respectfully. There is no one-size-fits-all rule. Every instance should be considered on a case-by-case -case basis, and to an extent, every reader is a custodian of their own relationship with these writings. I think the bottom line is that the lack of black and white canon is a huge part of what makes Tolkien's Legendarium so special. It's a huge part of why you are still watching this video about a very particular part of the writings of a man who died almost 50 years ago. Why do you care about anything I'm saying? Because Tolkien's Legendarium isn't just a series of stories, it's invented history. It's an insight into the mind of a guy who created something absolutely unique. And truly, that is not the opinion of some fan. I think that is an academically defensible statement. There are loads of different fantasy worlds, but none of them were created by a professor of language as a vehicle to explore language through the lens of an invented private mythology that went on to become so iconic it defined an entire genre for generations to come. No one has ever done what Tolkien did. Anyway, thank you all very much for joining me on this journey down a crazy rabbit hole. If you enjoyed it, hit like and leave a comment, and to make sure you don't miss any future videos, hit subscribe if you haven't already. However, as always, until next time, my dear friends, much love. Stay groovy, and Nevaya Melanine.